One of the biggest stories of 2022 has been unfolding around you every day and you might not even know about it. It's been happening where you get your morning coffee, your morning news, your groceries, your delivery packages. Because a lot of the people whose labor actually makes those things possible are organizing and so are many others. Those are graduate researchers and instructors at the University of California striking for a living wage. Just one of many high-profile worker actions that have made 2022 feel like a turning point for union labor in America. Just this year, new unions have been stood up at Starbucks coffee shops, at Trader Joe's grocery stores, at Apple stores, at Chipotle restaurants, and even at the video game maker Activision Blizzard. And there have been strikes or walkouts at Starbucks, Amazon, the University of California, Tyson Foods, McClatchy newspapers, and even the New York Times, where reporters walked the picket line last week to raise their union colleagues' salaries. The New York Times can afford to do better. They can raise the salary for to $65,000 a year, pay us more, get the raises up. We would love to go back to work. It's not just in America that this is happening. In Britain, rail workers, nurses, postal workers and the Border Patrol are all planning to mobilize what could be the biggest strike wave in the UK in 30 years. And why not? In many cases, the mere threat of a strike works. Back in November, after years of dragged out negotiations, 99 percent of the Delta Airlines pilot union voted to authorize a strike. Weeks later, the company agreed to a contract that gives those pilots a 30 percent raise over four years, one that's likely to drive up salaries across that industry. Labor unions are having a moment in America, possibly their brightest one for decades. But the question is, will this moment flourish into a full fledged movement? The conditions are ripe. A Gallup survey released in August showed that 71% of Americans now approve of unions, the highest mark recorded on this measure since 1965. And the National Labor Relations Board says that elections to form unions shot up 57% in the first half of 2022. And ostensibly, union workers even have an ally, so he says, in the White House. I intend to be the most pro-union president, leading the most pro-union administration in American history. That was a big promise. And while it was easy for Joe Biden to do better on labor issues than a Trump or a Bush, he's also made some moves that really demonstrate the Democratic Party's dysfunctional, some might say abusive relationship with labor unions, like when he signed legislation earlier this month to prevent a strike by U.S. railroad workers, legislation that denied those workers their main demand, paid sick leave. This is not about... Uh, the pay, necessarily, of these companies that think that they own our lives, this is a lot bigger than just the railroad industry. It's a disheartening compromise that may be soon repeated as union dock workers at West Coast ports enter a six-month of work without a contract and business leaders look to Biden to avert a strike that could snarl supply lines nationwide. It's a reminder of how little power unions really have in America compared to their heyday. According to the Wall Street Journal, more than a third of all workers in the private sector were unionized back in 1953. Last year, it was just 6 percent. As union power has waned, so has the Democratic Party's interest in being the union party. In the eyes of many workers, as party leaders courted Wall Street and boosted free trade at the expense of labor. On Friday, 70 members of Congress, led by Bernie Sanders and AOC, sent President Biden a letter saying he can make good on his union promises and give railroad workers their sick days through an executive order. But Biden has said he wants Congress to pass its own sick leave bill. Everybody wants someone else to fix the problem, except the union workers who say an injury to one is an injury to all. Because you work as a teacher and I work as a railroader and he works as a trucker and she works as a nurse and he works as in a coffee shop, we're all part of the working people that make society run. We're all part of the working class that produces the wealth. And without us, nothing could happen. And so when one of us is under attack, we're all under attack. So as businesses squeeze labor to keep profits high, as the Fed raises interest rates, even if it hurts salaries and employment, and as more and more workers are organizing for better lives, Joe Biden and the Democrats need to ask themselves, which side are they on?
Joining me now, Sarah Nelson, head of the largest flight attendants union, the Association of American Flight Attendants. She's also served on the Biden Sanders Unity Task Force as co chair of the Economy Task Force um, in the wake of the 2020 election. And Christian Smalls, he is president of the Amazon Labor Union and led the first successful union effort at any Amazon warehouse in the U.S. Thank you both for joining me. Sarah, what is the real state of unions today, even with all the new unions popping up? We're talking about a tiny share of private sector workers, roughly a fifth of the amount that were unionized a few generations ago in this country. Yeah, there's, there's been a persistent assault on workers and an attempt by the corporate elite to tell people uh, that you should feel lucky to have a job. And workers have had it. They have extracted everything that they can. And your opening that had comments from the rail workers talking about these companies thinking that they control our lives, that's exactly right. Down to the fact that a lot of these workers are walking off the job and standing up because the safety provisions on the job are not even in place. These are the reasons that unions organized. These are, re are the reasons that there were mass strikes in the early uh, part of the last century. And that instability is what led to the minimal labor law that we have in this country today. That was eroded with the passing of Taft-Hartley in 1958 and the persistent assault on unions to make unions smaller and smaller so that we can't put a check on that capital. We don't just live in a democracy. We live in a system of capitalism. And without a check on capitalism directly where that money is, that money is controlling our politics. It's controlling everything. So the state of the labor movement right now is that 71 percent of the American public say that they want a union. But corporations are able to interfere with that, try to slow things down, try to divide workers, delay results and make people demoralized. That's what they're working on. And Chris and I are yeah. out here telling people, listen, you have power today if you just come together. If every worker stands with their hands in their pockets, there is nothing that happens in this economy. And in fact, they stopped a strike by the railroad workers because those workers' work was so important to the American economy that they interrupted that. What if they had just allowed them to take that power and really take it to the bosses who have been taking tons and tons of profits off those workers' backs and have to answer for that greed that they have in place right now and have to answer directly to those workers. There never would have been a strike. So, Chris, why do you think unions are having a moment right now? What is happening to convince workers in all these disparate industries that they need to organize for better treatment? What arguments do you deploy? Well, you know, uh, Sarah couldn't have put any better. I mean, um, we are making unionize and relevant again. You know, the younger generation, um, the, the fact that Starbucks workers, Amazon workers, Apple, you name it, Trader Joe's, um, even Home Depot now on the scene, all these new industries are organizing. We're making these conversations travel to different spaces that have never been seen before. And with this, it comes the help of the labor movement pushing these politicians to amplify our efforts and vice versa. You know, we don't get these politicians to do their job unless we organize on the ground. And what you're seeing now is the point of no return. You know, the pandemic was a catalyst for a lot of people organizing and advocating for safety. But now we're at a point where we realize being deemed as an essential worker, our value is a lot more and we deserve a lot more. So uh, everything that you're seeing from Amazon uh, to railroad workers to Trader Joe's to Apple to Google to Tesla, uh, we're not going to stop. You know, we're going to continue organizing until we get what we rightfully deserve. And the working class, this moment yeah. in time, we all have to come together and stand on the same um, picket line. And of course, there's going to be pushback to that. Sarah, a lot of this labor moment seems to be due to low unemployment and high demand for workers after the pandemic, which gives workers power. But the Fed says that's driving up wages and that's driving up inflation. And so Fed Chair Jerome Powell plans more interest rate cuts to use his words to soften the labor market. How perverse of an economic system do we live in where the conventional economic wisdom is, oh, no, labor has it too good. We have to save this economy by reminding workers of their place. Yeah, I mean, this is just a continuation of the greed is good from Milton Friedman that has been running our economy for far too long. And we have to remind people that the beginning of the Constitution says we the people of the United States of America in order to form a more perfect union. This is about the people. You know, I stood in Miss Muldoon's classroom with my hand over my heart every day in kindergarten and said that Pledge of Allegiance that ended with indivisible with liberty and justice for all. 
We have never met that promise in this country, but that is a solemn promise that I thought that we were making to each other, and we have to make good on it. That is a completely perverse argument that you have to make people feel the pain in order for the economy to work. BS. The reality is that they have used greed tools like stock buy box and everything else to take all the money off the table for the workers, siphon it over to Wall Street. And let's just look at the massive gap in inequality right now in this country. The growing poverty masses and the billionaires who are building rockets to go to the moon while they leave the rest of us burning on the earth. That's the reality. Yes. And the and the line, the narrative that the Fed is pushing is just more of the same from the corporate elite who have been wanting to make us feel lucky to have a job. But you know what? Workers are saying we've had enough of it. We're going to come together and make sure that you know that you're lucky to have our work. Sarah, I love this image of you getting radicalized for workers' rights while you're in <laughs> kindergarten. I have this image in my head of you organizing <laughs> in the sandpit. Uh, Chris, you've helped organize Amazon, where thousands of warehouse workers worldwide staged a walkout on Black Friday to protest wages and working conditions. Still, of five Amazon warehouses to hold a union vote, only one, I believe, has voted to organize. Why is that? Talk to us about some of the ways you believe Amazon has tried union busting and deterring workers from organizing. Well, you know, um, it's not easy. You know, organizing is uh, strenuous and it's definitely 24-7. Uh, There's no days off. And Amazon is open 24-7, you know. So uh, we got to combat that. We got to combat trillions of dollars that they use against us. We got to co combat the 3,000 captive audiences that they put us into. We got to combat the fact that we're not allowed in or out around the building uh, before or after shift, which is really detrimental to organizing on the ground. Uh, and we got to combat the fact that there's been lies about unions for decades. You know, we're battling all of this um, at the same time. But what we're noticing uh, with these campaigns is that Amazon's is breaking the law every day. Same thing with Starbucks. They break the law every day because they know that the NLRB is underfunded. They know that these cases are going to take two or three years. And they know that there's no real justice unless we organize and continue to organize. And the workers on the ground, we don't have these resources. They know. So uh, what we have to do, once again, uh, as organizing, as leaders, we have to bring everybody into this fight. The community, this is your fight. When, uh, when the president gave $10 billion of tax dollars to Jeff Bezos to fly in the penis pocket, everybody should have been a man, not just the Amazon labor union, the working class. So bringing this fight to the community and bringing the community to the warehouse, this is how we're going to beat Amazon. Everybody has to be David versus Goliath. And Sarah, you mentioned billionaires a moment ago. Uh, there's former richest man in the world, now second richest man in the world, Elon Musk, who bought Twitter, fired, what, three quarters of its workforce, is now facing a picket line from union janitors who he fired as well, as well as an investigation into him setting up bedrooms at Twitter headquarters so workers can log crazy hours in the office. Um, Howard Schultz at Starbucks, Jeff Bezos at Amazon, now Elon Musk at Twitter. It seems like the CEOs, the billionaires, are a big part of this labor problem. There is a pattern of criminal behavior here. And the reason that they're able to continue as criminals is because there's not accountability. So, for example, there is a pattern of criminal behavior here by Howard Schultz against the workers organizing at Starbucks. That pattern should lead to a national bargaining order at Starbucks so that Howard Schultz is forced to come to the table and recognize that the baristas who are making his company a success, he's tearing it apart, by the way, with what he's doing. Um, but they are there every day making it a success in the community that he has to meet them at the table, hear their demands, and negotiate with them. That is not a hard thing to do, but that is what the government should be demanding of these billionaires and specifically of this pattern of criminal behavior where they are trying to continue to control everything. And that is what they're doing. They're hanging on with bare, white bare knuckles to try to control everything because to them it's a game. Who can be the richest? To the working people, it's just whether or not we can pay our rent or get health care or take care of our families. That's what it's about. And that, frankly, is more powerful than people who are playing a game of battleship away from the earth, not having to face anyone ever or be held accountable by anyone except for people yeah. like Chris Smalls and his, and his colleagues who organize and make them have to meet them at the table.